Uh, quite a lot of people in this audience have heard me speak on Connolly and Edinburgh, uh, but a lot of people in this audience I haven't met before, so I'm going to start on that before taking it into 1916 and obviously the Irish and the international dimension. Uh, <coughs> this year, the 100th anniversary um, of the rising, the 100th anniversary of Connolly's death, is something a lot of effort has been made into getting celebrated in Scotland. And of course in doing that, there is an awful lot of opposition. And we're going to deal with uh, some of the reasons for that opposition, but also, you know, although there's breakthroughs being made in the celebration of Connolly and his life, even in this city, uh, there are even in aspects of the celebration, there are things that are still getting suppressed in that. So, going to Connolly, Connolly himself, um, when he was, he, he, when he was born in Edinburgh, uh, from 19, from, sorry, from 1889 to 1896, he was very politically active in this city. Even people on the right wing of the Labour movement, writing histories of Edinburgh Socialist room before that, said Connolly was, what, what, was an amazing speaker, very, very good speaker, and very much the centre of socialist Labour and trade union activity at that time. Something that later gets airbrushed out of history. But uh, Connolly himself, when he was in Ireland, actually downplayed the fact he came from Scotland. Downplayed it. Never said, never in total denial that he came from Scotland, but even uh, one of his, uh, William McMullen, one of his very close associates from Belfast, William McMullen uh, said that Connolly came from Monaghan. Well, the Connolly family came from Monaghan. Um, and as a result of the famine, they left and came across to, uh, came across to uh, Scotland. But Connolly was born in the Cowgate in Edinburgh. Why did Connolly want to be relatively quiet about his Scottish background when he was active in Dublin? Uh, at that time, the Scottish-Irish connection uh, you know, wasn't all positive, um, quite apart from the, the fact that uh, the North had a reputation as you know, obviously the, the colonised north of many of the colonisers coming from Scotland. On top of that, the Irish in many places were likely to see their Scots in various roles, not least Scottish regiments. And at the time of the, uh, the, the gun running in the lead up to the uh, First World War, there had been gun running, the Royals had done gun running to Larne, there was gun running to, uh, 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 to Houth outside Dublin by the Irish Volunteer Force. When these guns were being brought into Dublin, it was the King's Scottish Own Borders on Bachelor War shot down some of these people. So it's perhaps not surprising Connolly wanted to hide that. How did he explain his accent? He had a broad Edinburgh accent to the end of his life. He said, that was a Monaghan twang. <laughs> and he got away with that in Dublin. That's what he was, he, he claimed that was Edgar Monaghan. Not only that, after the rising was over, um, um, Connolly was. You know, reclaimed by the Irish state, uh, his socialism very much downplayed. Uh, what was very much accentuated instead was, of course, this was this was an all Irish man of a, of a Catholic background. And uh, biographies you, re you read from the 30s and 40s about uh, Connolly, even those written by socialists, claim he was born in Monaghan. It wasn't until the 1960s that Desmond Greaves, who wrote the, the Life and Times of uh, James Connolly, he did the research, came back and found that not only had Connolly been born in Edinburgh, but he'd been extremely active in Edinburgh. So there was reasons in Ireland why they wanted to forget. What were the reasons in Scotland why they wanted to forget? Uh, why it was well, so Scot um, Connolly's role was very much recognised in the Labour <coughs> trade union social movement. He came back to the city in, uh, eight, in, in 1889. He had just um, absconded from the British Army. He thought his regiment was going to be sent uh, to India. And two things happened in his life. First of all, his father, who was employed by Edinburgh City Council, had had a serious accident and was quite seriously injured. At the same time, he was in the process of getting engaged to Lily Reynolds, uh, who he had met when he was in the British Army in Dublin. Uh, she, uh, <coughs> she's from a Protestant background and uh, she did house cleaning and he thought if he's going to be sent to uh, India then this could all fall apart. So he absconded from his regiment and came tentatively to Scotland. 
Uh, he avoided Edinburgh because he thought they'd be looking out for him in Edinburgh and went, first of all, uh, to Dundee. And it was in Dundee he became active with sourceless in, the, in that city. They just won the battle to have sourceless outdoors uh, meetings. Before that, they were suppressed. What finally turned the Dundee authorities was a meeting of 10,000 people on the streets of Dundee, actually before that, and so sources began being organised in Dundee. A very similar things was happening in Edinburgh at that time, where uh, Protestant bigots were also trying to prevent uh, sources organising on the meadows, and there were battles on them. Conley went to Dundee with his brother and organised in that city. He became a member of the Carters Union as well in that particular city. And one of the interesting things, just an example um, of how active he must have been, and obviously there's a, there's a, there's a certain ambiguity in this, particularly from Lily's point of view. He was about to, when he was about to get married, he sent a letter back to Lily saying, there's a car to strike on, to delay that wedding for the week, <laughs> which apparently happened. Now, one of the reasons that Connolly actually had to go to, uh, <coughs> when he got married, not in Edinburgh, but in Perth, by this time, he realised they weren't, the army wasn't certain for it, and actually, apparently, their books were so out of order, they hadn't even realised that he had absconded, but they realised he was he, he after them. But he couldn't get married in Edinburgh, because there, the, uh, the, here the, the, the bishop, the Catholic bishop of Edinburgh, who was unlike most bishops in the Roman Catholic Church, came from a Scottish background, he was horrified at the people under his control, under his control, overwhelmingly migrant Irish, little island around the county, 14,000 Irish people living in there, and he was from a Scottish Catholic background, and at the beginning of the 19th century, Scottish Catholics would become more and more acceptable in Scottish society, then suddenly after the famine, thousands and thousands of uh, Irish migrants, very coarse, rough and ready, coming place, and I mean, he was horrified that uh, you know, that this was undermining the position of Catholicism, but worse than that, these people were becoming very politically involved in the Land League, and um, the, 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 the Catholic Church, St. Patrick's there, was doing everything possible to keep that community under control. Uh, there were the Shubins all over the place, uh, where lots of the Irish community went to, but one of the things they did, they produced the, uh, the Young Catholic Men's Association in St. Mary's Street, which is where Hibernian Football Club was founded, uh, the idea was to try and keep uh, men out of the pubs of Shabines and also out of too much political activity. But just to cap it all, the person who was chair of the Catholic Young Men's Association himself, Michael Flanagan, invited somebody from the Land League across to speak on the Meadows, a huge big meeting, and um, the bishop was extremely upset by that. He held, he, he, he dismissed Michael Flanagan from the, the, um, the, the uh, Catholic Young Men's Association and Conley's first two political interventions in this city are speaking in two meetings, one in which is now Malone's bar, it was in, uh, um, <coughs> it was in a, 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 I forgot the name of the hall, but come, come back to the hall there. The other one was down at St. 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 Mar uh, Mary's uh, Church in Leith to try and get <coughs> Michael Flanagan reinstated in that job. Conley himself was involved, had been involved when he joined the Catholic Young Men's Association every week he went down and took the Hibs strips down to the Hibs ground and got sixpence for that. So he, he was part of past this community. But at that time, uh, this, you know, this, this was the beginning, uh, politics were pulling this community apart. In particular, the net effect of the Land League, the Irish Land League, had been created, first of all, the Irish uh, uh, Nationalist Party under, under Parnell, and it very much opted for a deal with the Liberals obviously a very prominent party at that time, no more so than in this particular city, deal with the Liberals, in return for giving back into the Liberals, the Liberals were meant to deliver home rule. That was going very well um, in, in this particular city until suddenly Parnell was involved, was revealed to be involved in this in a scandal with Kitty O'Shea and the Liberal Party backers in throughout Scotland, and in this city in particular, who come from a Presbyterian background, it didn't look too kindly on these sort of shenanigans and so they suddenly distanced themselves uh, from Parnell and the Irish community was completely split over that. What uh, Connie said, what you know, Connie started campaigning for in this city, which brought him into conflict with a lot of people, was we need a new alliance. It's not an alliance between the Land League, Nationalist Party and the Liberals. 
It's a, an alliance between the, uh, the Irish and socialists. That's what he was uh, trying to uh, achieve in this particular city. And he organized the trade unions, the Carters Trade Union. He organized in the infant Scottish Labour Party, which was formed in 1888, directly out of inspiration uh, from the Land League. The Land League had put in 1885, they put up candidates in, well actually in 1880 first of all, then in 1885 they put up candidates in Ireland and, uh, against the uh, Tories and Liberals and had won an overwhelming majority of seats there. The Highland Land League took inspiration from that and in the 1885 elections they put up candidates in Scotland against the Tories and the uh, Lib Liberals in, in Scotland. Something nobody thought you'd do. Trade unionists were all affiliated to the Liberal Party at that time. Nobody thought that was possible. They stood in six seats and won four of those seats. One of those seats was Argyll, and they won with a Catholic uh, member. Now, Argyll is not a very Catholic area, but one of the first Catholic MPs was uh, from the Highland Land League in Argyll. Kia Hardy was noticing this and thought, what? You can stand against both Liberals and Labour, uh, sorry, and uh, Tories, and win. And that's when the Scottish Labour Party was set up in 1888. He didn't make the same breakthroughs at that particular time, but Connolly was very much involved when he came, was involved in the Scottish uh, Labour Party, but also he saw the need for a socialist attraction with the pull of attraction for the Scottish Socialist Federation within that and in the Carters Union. And it was these vehicles that were the vehicles for his, getting his ideas across in, in, in Edinburgh. He stood, uh, he, he was campaigning very strongly for, for around the eight hour day, uh, and he was also started a campaign in, in elections. Uh, as a result of campaigning in elections in defiance of uh, the Liberal Party and the Irish nationalists and that, he found it very difficult to get room, uh, rooms to speak, he organized meetings by open air meetings, chalking on the pavement, outside of his workplace down at um, in King Stables Road, which is where is a manure cart, but also on street corner meetings. And uh, had quite an impact at that point. Didn't win any of any uh, any seats, uh, but certainly made quite an impact. And in particular, worked closely with a man called John Leslie. John Leslie was somebody from a mixed Scottish and Irish Fenian background, who wrote probably after Marx and Engels the first like Marx's analysis of Ireland that was published in the Social Democrats uh, Justice paper at that particular time. Connolly worked very close closely with him. He became very well known in this city. When his brother was actually the person who was prominent to begin with, but his brother, through his campaign for the eight hour day, uh, lost his job. At this point, I should point out that both James and John were Carters. Remember, I've told you the father, who was, was a Carter, had that serious injury in 1889. The father was directly employed by Edinburgh City uh, uh, Council at that particular directly <coughs> employed. And when he had that serious injury, he was given another job. He became the janitor at the Haymarket Toilets, which is still there today. It's interesting, out of the five houses that James Connolly lived in Edinburgh, four of them had been completely destroyed, uh, destroyed because of obviously very poor quality houses. One is still there, the one in the Westport. But actually, the toilets block is direct farther with them, is still there. So it's giving you some idea of the sort of conditions of the housing must have, uh, must have been at that time. But uh, his brother lost his job uh, because he was on a temporary contract. James was on a temporary contract. And when the uh, brother, that's when Connie stepped into his shoes and became much better, better known as an organizer. He brought people from all over, the, uh, all over the country, from Blackburn, from uh, Eleanor Marks, who was brought up uh, speaking that. So he got, he got, he got uh, uh, first of all, he started chairing meetings and then he started speaking himself. So he got a, a quite enviable reputation. But because he was up front and he stood in the elections, in, 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 for, in, for the Board of Guardians, he crossed authorities again, and the same thing happened to him as happened to his brother. His contract wasn't renewed. He tried to be a cobbler, working in a shop on McClue Street. Uh, however, he's an appalling cobbler. He had adverts in the local paper, and people said they just did it out of charity, but he realised that wasn't going anywhere. And he was about to give up and take his family now with three children, who had all been born in that uh, six years, to Chile, when the Dublin Social Society, having heard about Connolly's reputation as a speaker, invited him across with the intention of opening up a branch of the Independent Labour Party, which had formed across the UK in 1893. An Independent Labour Party intended to organise in England, Scotland, Wales, and the whole of Ireland. That's what the intention was. Keir Hardy provided him with money to go across. The only thing is, when 
Connolly went to Dublin. He didn't set up a branch of the Independent Labour Party. He set up the Irish Socialist Republican Party. And from then, from then on, in many ways, you can see <coughs> we're following a different trajectory. We'll take a stick, I'm not going to cover all those years, until 1916. Different trajectory for <coughs> the rest. Heinemann, who was the dominant Marxist at that time, advocated a British road to socialism. And de facto, that was the position of uh, most, most people. Uh, Connolly more and more said, no, what we need is a breakup of the UK and British Empire road to socialism. And he very much was uh, uh, pioneered that particular, particular tradition. And of course, it was that tradition that brought him to the rising in 1916. He saw the chance in 1916 of offering a fundamental challenge to the British Empire and also to the UK state uh, by throwing himself into the rising. And uh, this is a time when, of course, Britain's in the middle of a war. Uh, once he had, once he committed himself to that, socialists in the rest of the UK and in Scotland, with the exception of an honourable minority, tried to distance himself very much from James Connolly, and it's, that's the beginning of the attempt in Edinburgh to say, James Connolly, he's not going to do this. That's something that happened over in Ireland. And so he gets suppressed. It wasn't until the 1970s that a banner first appeared in the city, a trade union banner, um, was that's what was my man who died a few years ago, Turlock McDade, um, a branch of the TNG with the first Connolly banner in the city. So from 19... 16 to 1974, uh, memory of Connolly was very much suppressed. Connolly himself didn't think much of this particular city. There's a wonderful quote about Masha's flunkers, students dominating this. He had a lot of time for Leith, but not for this particular city. But of course, Edinburgh was very much um, a, 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 a secondary centre of, uh, of empire, centre of finance. And ministry of civil service, so also very much a garrison town as well. So all of these things were things that put pressure um, on denying Connolly's memory. So this, uh, that's, that, you know, what we're wanting to do this year is reclaim Connolly. So yes, he's part and parcel of uh, in, uh, in, uh, everything, everything about the Irish Rising we yeah, want to celebrate, but he's also part and parcel of our history in this particular city. And we would very much like to see a new monument from much bigger than the plaque down uh, in this particular city. And to do that, we're not just making this some uh, uh, an Irish tourist attraction, but actually celebrate the fact that Connolly, uh, and it was Lenin who actually said it, said the 1916 rising effectively was the beginning of the international revolutionary wave. It kicked it off. He said it was premature, but that's what kicked it off. And in many ways, the moves to suppress him today are again the moves to try and you know, um, deny that anti-imperial legacy, particularly at a time when the UK is throwing itself into one imperial war after that. So we have a lot to celebrate in, in Connolly, and this is the year to try and make him relevant, relevant again in this city, in the whole of these islands, and across the world. Thank you. Take the questions afterwards. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks, Eileen, and thank you to International Socialism Scotland and uh, RS21 for inviting me here to, to speak tonight. And thanks, Alan, for an excellent presentation. That was absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, um, Alan uh, made a, uh, uh, it went to great lengths to bamboozle everybody into believing that Connolly was born in Edinburgh, <laughs> when it's a fact that he's a great son of Ireland and was born in County Monaghan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll get back to that as the talk goes on. So I'll say a bit about myself first. Um, I, I lived in the United States for 22 years. Um, I went out there in the early 1990s. Uh, and I uh, was a member of the International Socialist Organization in the U.S. Uh, I was on the editorial board of the International Socialist Review. Um, and I organized uh, in the labor movement, in the anti-war movement, and the immigrant rights movement. And the immigrant rights movement, I was just thinking about that recently because uh, March 10th, 2006, was, is the, was the day of the massive immigrant rights demonstrations across the U.S. Um, that, uh, 
you know, turned into a, a massive movement in defense of uh, immigrants and to stop the deportation of 12 million workers, 12 million people, families from the U.S. and that battle still rages. Uh, but in the part where we actually started, the de where the demonstration happened on March 10th, uh, there was a big statue of Connolly uh, in Union Park, which is just fascinating to think about Connolly's uh, significance globally and what he means to people and how Irish people in the U.S. Uh, carried the you know the the legacy of his struggles here and, and obviously the work that he did in the U.S. as well, which I'll talk a wee bit about as well. Um, there's two, I know there's two statues in the U.S. of Connolly. Uh, I've only seen one so far in Ireland, which is something we have to address and try and, and try and turn around. I'm not sure if there's many statues to Connolly in Scotland. There should be. Maybe that's uh, something that future campaigns um, we uh, we can take up. Um, so I wanted to start out as well by talking a bit about this year, 2016, the commemorations and the responses to that, because the, the Irish establishment, who are the inheritors of 1916, supposedly, of a, a, of a liberated Irish state, or at least a partially liberated Irish state, have been more or less schizophrenic in the way that they've dealt with these commemorations. I think that they would prefer that the... 2016 and the anniversary of uh, 1916 wasn't happening, but they 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 have to they have to mark this event because it is in Irish history a found foundational event uh, that created um, modern Ireland. So how they went about marking the commemoration? There will be all sorts of state commemorations over the next several weeks. Um, but they also produced a video, and this lets you know how they've been kind of, the, the hot potato on how they've tried to deal with it. They produced a video called Vision 2016, uh, which was essentially to say, a hundred years on from the rising, this is the modern Ireland that was given birth to, uh, but it didn't actually mention.